Good evening, folks. Uh, I'm really excited. Um, again, for those who don't know me, my name is Lee Pinkowitz. Uh, in addition to being uh, finance faculty here, I am uh, associate director of student engagement at uh, the newly named uh, Pissarro's Center for Financial Markets. So you actually are the, this is technically the first event under the oh, name. Did, you did, you did. So we really appreciate it. I'm really excited about, about this one um, because, so what, one of the things that actually got me interested in, in finance, and this goes way back, you may remember this. Uh, I read a book in the in mid eighties uh, it was a book called Technical Analysis Explained by Martin Pring. I have it. Yeah, it's right. It, yeah, and it, it's an incredible, it was amazing. So I was a lot younger at the time. Me and and um, it got me very interested in, in finance. And I started watching what at the time was FNN, right? Yeah, it was the, it was pre the precursor to CNBC. And there was a guy named John Bollinger, which you've heard I Bollinger Band. Okay. Uh, so I'm real, and, and I recognize now that as an academic, I keep telling you that technical analysis uh, doesn't work. But I have to tell you, I'm super excited because this is sort of where it started for me. Okay. So I'm I'm really excited. Anyway, um, John Roke is senior managing director and head of technical strategy at 22 V Research. Uh, he's been on Wall Street since 1987 at a variety of of different places, right, including. Um, uh, Safian Investment at Lehman, uh, Wolf Research. Um, we talked about, or, or remember the, the difference between the sell side and the buy side. You've been on both. Right. So I That's worked right. at Soros Fund Management as well for uh, four years and then Key Square for three years, yeah. which came out of Soros. So I have both sell side. I was sell side for 20 years, buy side for seven, and I'm back on the dark side again. <laughs> Those of you in the room, please, yeah. inter inter not interrupt, yeah. but raise hands. Of course. We'd like this to be interactive like the other ones. Um, so, John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. Thank you so thanks. much. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Thanks for having me. Uh, glad to be here. Um, if I talk and there are no questions until the end, this is going to be terrible. Um, so I want you to, to come along with me, uh, if you will. So you can see I kind of have this sort of sense of humor, uh, and that's kind of the way I send my notes or reports to clients. Last night, I sent out a note to clients entitled Seven Blocks of Granite with a question mark. So I went to a Jesuit university in the Bronx, Fordham University. And when I went there, I wished I had been going to a Jesuit university that had good basketball, just like you guys do now, right? You wish you had good basketball. Um, sorry. Yeah, no, um, so um, I have to be provocative in the way I get my message across. The reason being is I think that my job is to hit a home run. I'm not a trader, I'm a trender. So um, I bought gold at 1950 in June of 2019, and I thought it would go to a new all-time high. In December of 2020, I thought we were in a new commodity bull market. Late last year, I thought it was an easy call for rates to get to 3% across the curve. It's not a hard call. We make it hard. I'm going to get to a chart, which I think may be the most important thing I'm going to leave you with. It has nothing to do with anything that's going on here with respect to the market, bonds, stocks, commodities, nothing. It's just going to be the way to think about things, okay? So technicals really is the truth, okay? So I have here the contrarian investor. Contrarian is when sentiment and the charts do not agree. For example, you can't find one analyst on Wall Street who's bearish semiconductors right now. What are semiconductors doing? Does anybody know? They're going down. The median bear market for semis over the SOX's history, that's a semiconductor index, is 35%. I have a target of 2440 for the semiconductor index. It's when the charts and the sentiment do not agree. Contrarian is not opposite. Everybody walked in from outside. If I went outside and I said, it's going to rain, that would not be contrarian. That would be wrong. So it is always important to check your fundamental view against what the chart is saying. Now, I will tell you, the charts are not always right. But when you have both working for you in your favor, then it's your time to swing big and try to hit a home run. Okay. So this is a primer. I'm going to get through this quickly. If you want this, I'll send it to you. If you see any charts in here that you want, I'll send it to you. If you need the data, I'll send it to you. But I'm going to get from this 
to what I think is an institutional presentation. And that's when I hope that you will ask questions. If you asked them before, even better. Okay, so here's a little background. Uh, please, if you wanna read a book, Andrew Lowe wrote the book, The Evolution of Technical Analysis, Financial Prediction from Babylonian Tablets to Bloomberg Terminals. Okay, so um, we think that there's an efficient market. It's really not an efficient market. It's an inefficient market, which is why most people didn't own energy recently, right? Right. You've heard of this ESG push. It's a terrible idea. It has forced managers into the technology bucket more than they wanted to be or more than they thought they needed to be. Who's led the energy push higher? Does anybody have any idea which group of investors? Retail investors have led it higher. Why? Because there's a plethora of ETFs to use to get into that. Institutional investors did not. They did not. They couldn't. They have an ESG mandate. You can't buy energy stock. You can't buy mining stocks. You can't buy carbon producing stocks. I've made six of my own indexes, uranium, shippers, fertilizers, gold, and uh, two others. My, my indexes have killed the S&P and NASDAQ and gone up a ton on an absolute basis. You have to have an open mind in this business. Now I said I worked for four years at Soros Fund Management. The most famous person to have worked at Soros Fund Management outside of George Soros was Stanley Druckenmiller. Does anybody know the name? Okay, Druckenmiller, there's, there's a lot of legends about Druckenmiller and Soros. A great legend, which I like to think about, is that someone once went to Druckenmiller and said, I've never met a rich technician. Druckenmiller said, I'm a rich technician. And he is. There's also another story, which I kind of um, put in here as well. When Druckenmiller got to Soros, he didn't know how to tell George that he was a technical guy and it really was bothering him. Now, this may be legend. It may be true. It may not be. And he was felt the need to go and kind of open himself up to George Soros. And as he was crossing the corridor, George was coming to him and said, hey, I have something to talk to you about. I wanted to show you this chart. And Druckenmiller then said, I, I'm in the right place. Okay. Uh, I've used this line for a long time. Charts are the language of Wall Street. As I said, I was 20 years on the sell side, seven years on the buy side, and now back on the sell side. I've given a million presentations. I've seen a ton of presentations. When people come to your office and give a presentation, the, their packet is filled with charts. Even if they're fundamental people, their package is filled with charts. Charts are the language of Wall Street. Okay, there are some other things in here, of course. Um, you know, the technicals actually go back to Roman seasonality patterns, Greek market sentiment assessments, Babylonian price records. It goes back forever. There's long history of this. It's just when uh, in the last decade or so, people felt there wasn't a need for it. And why? Rates were pinned at zero and stocks trended higher. Rates are no longer pinned at zero. And who do people call when they want to figure out what's going on at the market? That's when, you want to, that's when they want to talk to a technical person. Uh, the most important um, quote in here comes from Michael Crichton, who wrote The Andromeda Strain and Jurassic Park, et cetera. He said, if you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You're a leaf that does not know it is part of a tree. The chart provides you the history to the item you are looking at. Okay, the history is in the chart. Now, does anybody see what the CPI was today? Highest since when? You know how long it was, uh, it was elevated during that period? During that period? Well, inflation, it took the Fed seven years to get inflation under control at that time. So the PPI will be reported shortly. Don't worry about it. Tell them I'll call them later. Um, so uh, the PPI, uh, CPI printed today, um, this was the 13th straight month where it was above 4% year on year. 13 straight months. I created an indicator last April when Jay Powell told us this was transitory and I knew it was gonna be wrong. The only thing you had to do was count how many times the PPI or CPI had been above a certain threshold level. When it gets above, it must go much higher. It was a period in the early 80s where the PPI printed 6% monthly numbers year on year for nearly five years in a row. It's unconscionable that anybody at the Fed could not be aware of that. I'm gonna trigger you. I, I really am cynical about the Fed. Really am cynical about the Fed. 
Okay. So I have this chart in here for gold. Um, so I got really lucky with gold in October, on October 31st of 2001. I wrote a report when I was at uh, Arnhold and S. Fleischroder. It was called Totally and Unequivocally Bullish. And I met with what I would call the five mafia families in Boston, anybody who had ever owned gold prior to that period in the 70s and the early 80s. I went to hear Richard Scott Ram speak, who was the head of the World Gold Council, the strategist of the World Gold Council. I went to hear Jim Grant speak, who runs Grant's Interest Rate Observers. I went to hear John McElwraith speak, who was running the De Tocqueville Gold Fund. And I worked at a place called Arnold and S. Bleichroder, who employed a gentleman by the name of Jean-Marie Aviard, who was a Buffett disciple, and he ran a gold fund. And I would go and speak to him about gold, and I couldn't figure out why I was leaving his office more bullish on gold than he was. But I learned because he had run a gold fund for eight years and all it did was go down. At the time, I was also writing a column for thestreet.com. And at the end of my column, because I wanted people to read my column, I put a trivia question. First person who answered the trivia question, I'd send you a copy of the book, The Power of Gold, which was written by Richard Bernstein, who also wrote Against the Gods, the Story of Risk. I met with Richard, uh, Peter Bernstein, pardon me, Peter Bernstein, Richard Bernstein's a strategist. I met with Peter Bernstein. I had lunch with him. And I said to him, Mr. Bernstein, I really loved your book. It didn't read like an academic treatise. It read like a novel. Why did you write it? He said, John, I read, wrote it because I hate gold. I said, I, I don't understand. He said, you were a student of statistics, a good student of statistics, weren't you? I said, well, I probably should have done better. He said, that's okay. I'm going to give you a statistics problem right now. He said, I'm going to come to your apartment tomorrow morning. I'm going to ring your doorbell. And I'm going to say, let's take a walk around the uh, streets of Manhattan all day long. Beautiful fall day. Chris, you wear a sweatshirt. We'll have a jolly time. He actually did use the word jolly. So you come downstairs and I'm gonna tell you, John, when we go on this walk, there's a 5% there's a chance that you get hit by a car. You as a student of statistics say what? I say 95% chance I don't get hit. Let's go. He says, statistically, that's the correct way to think about it. However, the ramifications of you being hit by a car are so brave and dangerous that you must have insurance on yourself. That's gold to your portfolio. So everybody I met with back in this period thought gold would work on an absolute, on a relative basis because PE multiples were so high. You know, that was in the uh, um, technology bu uh, bubble dot com era. Nobody thought gold could go up on an absolute basis. I got lucky. I thought it could. Gold broke out of that base there. And I said, gold will make a new all time high in this cycle. I got to tell you seriously, and I'm not being a wise guy. These are not tremendous calls. When you see an item like this that's rounding off and gets above an upper sloping 12 month moving average, you can't be negative anymore. You can't be. When you see an item like this that breaks out of a base above an upward sloping 12 month moving average, you can't be negative. You can't be. So when you are looking at an item, no matter what it is, yields, commodity prices, gold, oil, stocks, indexes, the SOX, the XLU, the XLE, if it breaks out of a base in that formation and it is above an upward sloping 12 month moving average, you can't be negative. Okay, here's the most important thing I'm gonna leave you with tonight. If you want this chart, I'll send it to you. In 1974, Paul Slovic, who was a professional, uh, he had a professional horse handicapper study. You can see it right here. When he gave the professional horse handicappers zero data points, they had a 10% accuracy rate. Their confidence was also at 10%. When he gave them five data points, their accuracy went to 17%. Their confidence was a little bit higher. When he gave them 40 data points, their accuracy did not improve, but their confidence was through the roof. I thought this is right up my alley. So I told you I worked at Soros Fund Management. I didn't get this directly from Mr. Soros, but he had a great line. He said, just give me enough information. When I was at Key Square, George Tenet, who's the former director of the CIA, was in our offices for a meeting. And I asked him this question. I said, as the director of the CIA, and you have, how much information do you need in order to make a decision? And he said, that's a good question. If it's going to take me five years to get 95% of the information or two years to get 70% of the information, I'm going on the two years. I'm not waiting for five years. All of us in this business try to get every piece of information we, we can get our hands on. 
because we think it's going to help us. You don't need every piece of information. The longer you stay in the business, the more information you will discard. You will figure out what works for you and you will only stick with those items. So my polite suggestion to you is, as you do your own investments, stop looking for the information that you think is going to give you an edge. The likelihood that you'll get it before some professional will is pretty darn small. Find the information that you know will give you an edge to win. That's what you need. Okay. As a technical guy, I am a momentum guy at heart. However, momentum is not a factor, it is a characteristic. Momentum, as everybody knows now, is attending this year energy, natural resource related items, commodity related items. Momentum on the downside is attending big cap financials, home builders, semiconductors, software stocks, and big cap tech. Momentum is key to winning in our business. If you're a value guy and you buy a stock at 10 because it's worth 15 and it goes from 10 to 20, you don't win because the stock stayed value. You won because it got less cheap, right? You want your value stocks to win, but not because they're gonna stay cheap. You want them to get expensive, okay? Momentum wins throughout all cycles. It's just afforded a different name. Sometimes it's growth, sometimes it's value, sometimes it's gold, sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's healthcare, Sometimes it's consumer discretionary. Momentum is a key characteristic. Please do not discard it. I like to say that if you are a momentum person, somebody will say to you like this in the business, oh, you just buy momentum. Well, don't you want momentum in your career? Don't you want it for your family? If you have children, don't you want it for your children? In their schoolwork. If you're a sports fan, don't you want it for your teams? But it, to be unwashed if you want it in our business. It's not to be unwashed. It's the only way to win. The guy who wins, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, are momentum investors and trend followers, is that synonymous or is there a distinction? What is exactly? No, I think there, I, I think we can, for the purpose of this, yeah, I think they'll be synonymous. That's fine, okay. that's fine. And if you'll notice in this environment, and I mean this environment post GFC, the trends tend to go much further than they would have gone in prior cycles. The reason being, is that there are so many fewer value investors in this cycle than they have been in prior cycles. Go ahead. So on that, I think maybe this is part of where you're talking about our big trend followers and how those guys get crushed uh, versus uh, uh, other platforms that have all these guys in the same space. Um, I don't think most quant funds are, are trend followers. I really don't. I really don't. What I would ask you is how come more quant funds haven't been able to replicate Renaissance Technologies returns? That's what I would ask. I'm not being a wise guy. I, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, if quant is so terrific, I'm not knocking anybody who's doing it. How come nobody's been able to produce returns like Renaissance did? Okay, uh, this is not about an election. So please, don't go crazy. Um, so uh, this, the day this happened, I bought four copies of the New York Post. Uh, I have one of these framed. I gave it to Scott Besson, who runs Key Square. Um, I gave it to a buddy of mine, and I gave it to another guy, Jason Trent, if you had him in here. Yeah. So Jason's colleague, Pat Ball, has the others. They're the only four in existence. I got it because it was the greatest piece of sentiment information anybody's ever had. So I'm going to give you the backdrop to this, and then I'm going to move on. Um, in October of 2016, I went to, a at, went to a hedge fund dinner. And you know how you are at a hedge fund dinner because the questions at the hedge fund dinner are 10 minutes long because everybody's got to prove how smart they are to everybody else. The host or the guest of honor was a guy named Philip Tetlock who wrote a book called Super Forecasting. So he was sitting here, I was sitting here and the table went like a quarter mile down there and came all the way around. So the questions went around this way and I was the last guy who asked the question. And I said to him, Dr. Tetlock, it is quite unlikely that anybody in this room will become a super forecaster. What can you tell us about becoming better forecasters? And he said, that's a good question. I was just on the phone with my best forecaster. And 
I think that the quality of being a good forecaster is a lack of hubris. And then he contradicted himself immediately. He said, and my best forecaster said that she raised Hillary Clinton's chance to 99% to win the election. I said to myself right there immediately, she can't win. Can't win. Nobody should have that much confidence about a forecast. And then I asked him a second question. I said, in your long career, have you ever decided to take a contrary opinion consensus poll about various uh, macro items, S&P level, dollar, yen, gold, euro dollar, not gas, oil, you know the drill. I said, and found that consensus and done the exact opposite. He said, you mean in a contrary manner? I said, yeah, he said, I never thought of that before. So I said to myself, this is an opportunity. So perhaps in your fund here, you could take a half of 1% of your AUM and put it in the most contrary idea you can find, provided that the charts agree with your contrary opinion. So a contrary opinion to me right now would be to short socks of the SMH because the street is not prepared for that. Okay, I, I've listed some books here, or I listed some quotes, pardon me. So um, I'm gonna tell you, uh, I, I'm old now, and I read all the books that I could possibly read about technical analysis, and then I stopped. And then I started to read books about humans, uh, eras, historical eras, historical cycles, because I wanted to learn how people react. People react the same way all the time when it comes to the stock market. There is greed and there is fear, period. However, there are some good quotes here that I think is very important, are very important. The last one, well, first off, Jesse Livermore, did anybody ever read Reminiscences of a Stock Operator? Okay, terrific. Uh, he committed suicide in the uh, Sherry Nettleman Hotel, but that's a different story. Uh, the obvious rarely happens. The unexpected constantly occurs. It is very difficult to remove yourselves from, remove yourselves from the consensus thought. Very difficult. But if you do it, you can see clearly with respect to what is occurring in the market. Very difficult. There is solace or comfort in the crowd. Number two, Martin Armstrong, who runs a website called Armstrong Economics. Um, there's a documentary about him called The Forecaster. You should watch that one. He said the major uh, majority must be wrong for big moves to occur. That's really true because everybody then has to come along, right? Okay. Um, we'll leave Marty Rubens out. We'll leave uh, uh, Corey's out, but here's Jesse May. There's a book uh, Jesse May wrote called um, Shut Up and Deal. Jesse May was a poker player in and around the New York area before Texas Hold'em became popular. He'd go to uh, Dr. Pinkowitz's uh, house apartment on a Tuesday night, play, from, uh, play poker from nine to three in the morning, come home $500 richer. Richer, he'd go to my apartment. Uh, he'd go to mine on Wednesday night and do the same thing. And he wrote this book, um, which is really a good read, Shut Up and Deal. But this quote here to me is really about the market or all markets. People think mastering the skill is the hard part, but they're wrong. The trick to poker is mastering the luck. That's philosophy. Understanding luck is philosophy. Knowing where you are in any particular cycle, that really comes over time with what you've seen before. Have you seen this movie before? Are people on the wrong side? Are you thinking about what you're reading? Is it reacting, or pardon me, is it agreeing with what we're seeing in the charts? This is important stuff. Yeah, when you were showing charts of these bull breakouts, what is it about the 12 months that we have to be So I like to think of it like this. Um, let's say, uh, so New York City Marathon's in November. This is, uh, this is April. So let's say all of us were going to run the New York City Marathon in November. We probably should start to train now, right? Because if we started in October, we'd have a crap race. If we start now, I don't know, we'll have a good race, but we probably can finish. The base setup is the building of a fundamental story, right? Stocks break out, not for technical reasons, they break out for fundamental reasons. The slope to that moving average is just kind of like my bodyguard. I don't know the fundamental story, but the upward sloping 12 month moving average is kind of like my bodyguard. I don't really think I'm gonna be hurt too badly if I buy stocks or items that are coming out of a base with an upward sloping 12 month moving average. So the breakout is the manifestation of a fundamental story. New product, better pricing, oligopoly structure, better management, 
you know, um, buying a new business, more growth, whatever it is. That's what happens when there's a breakout. Anything special about a 12 month particular? Um, the most important signals come from monthly charts, not from daily charts. So we, all of us sit really close to our screen, especially if this is what you do for a living. The prices are up there all day long on the Bloomberg. You're really close to it. You really get a better idea of what's happening when you take your chart out and look at monthly charts, which is why I said I'm a trender, not a trader. Okay, it is important also, if you watch CNBC, to listen to the nomenclature. Until quite recently, this is what we were hearing. It's a stock picker's market. Nobody ever says that when the market's going up. No one ever says it. They only say it when nobody's making money. So please, you have to think clearly about what you're hearing. So do you have any view on so Nassim Taleb? Yeah, I like Taleb. He's done, okay, so if you've not read anything by him, he's incredibly right and still tells you. But uh, he will tell you. He will tell you. Uh, but if you don't know, he, he is, would you consider him a contrarian? Uh, his hedge fund basically um, takes deep out of the money puts, right? So think of them, if he, his view is hedge funds, so it's that center. Those that have imploded and those that haven't imploded yet, right? Uh, and I was, I, I'm just curious, what, do you view him as contrarian? Because and then the psychology of what Taleb does is insane to me. Because if you buy these very deep out of money, puts, you lose basically all of your money, almost all the time. Until the black swan event. Until the black swan event starts, and then he makes up for it for the entire day. So I just yeah, I, I don't know that I could stomach his um, yeah. his modus operandi, so to speak. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I do like reading him. He is very provocative, and he is also very um, um, unafraid to tell you exactly what he thinks. Not only what he thinks, but what he thinks about you. Okay. <laughs> Um, so here goes. Uh, does anybody know the phrase "the market will be higher one year from now"? Or, or how about this one? I'm buying for the long term. Uh, you know that one? It's really a nothing statement. So uh, I went back um, over 28,000 trading days. Any date in history, let's say it's today, five years ago, and you went forward one year from that, you're up almost 70 percent of the time. It's really a nothing statement. The market's built up. When it's not up one year later is when you're either in a bear market or a recession. So there is something to be said for having a good entry point because you could certainly lose a lot before the market ends up turning upward. There were long periods. I mean, look at this. 16 years of sideways. It was a high inflationary period. The 74 downturn was, I remember the old timers and I say that respectfully coming in and saying the market went down every single day for a year. And then uh, I got in the business here. So I saw 87, I saw 90, which in retrospect was nothing. Um, and then 98, you can't even really see it. This was 94, uh, you can't even really see it. This was 98, this was the Asian Russian LTCM crisis and then the tech bull market into here. Then you went sideways for 13 years before the Dow broke out. But you have gone sideways for long stretches and you have, have to have a different approach during that time. Now, uh, Present another question, but there's a question online. Shoot. Would you say that Jack Bogle was a contrarian when he started Vanguard's index funds? And is index investing now too mainstream? I think Jack Bogle should go on the uh, Mount Rushmore of, um, of investors. Uh, I think Bill O'Neill, who started Investors Business Daily, now it's Investors Daily, yeah. with his canceling approach, should also be up there. Uh, Stan Druckenmiller should also be up there. I'm going to miss some. Um, but um, I do think he was probably uh, a contrarian then when he saw a market that uh, uh, he could address. And I think people have um, come to believe now that that's all you need. I think it's not all you need. Um, last week or so, George Noble was here and he gave a presentation. He used my chart. Yeah. Um, I've known George since the mid 90s. Um, this is the way I think the bell curve of market emotions looked. Uh, where are you? Yeah, it's rhetorical, you don't have to answer. Um, where's the Fed? Anybody? Denial. Yeah, I really think they're. I think they're here. I think they're they're kind of here. First, they were oblivious because they told us inflation was transitory. Now they're in disbelief, and I think they're really kind of stuck. I think they're really stuck. So at the end of January, early February, Mary Daly, who's the San Francisco Fed president, said, 
we are not behind the curve. We are not behind the curve at all. Then a month later, she was calling for a 50 basis point increase in the Fed funds rate. I mean, come on, Mary. Um, Run DMC had a line in one of their songs, Mary, Mary, why you bugging? It was clearly appropriate. <laughs> Um, and this is where I think commodities are, right in here. The business does not own commodities or commodity-related equities. In all of 2021, it was really difficult for me to make a phone call to an institutional investor and try to convince them to buy some Freeport McMoran. And Freeport McMoran quintupled off of its low. It's killed the big technology stocks in terms of performance. In fact, the Bloomberg Commodity Index, since the COVID low, has beaten the S&P and NASDAQ. Okay, if this was the only chart you had, oh yeah, shoot. Oh, I, don't, I can't do that. <laughs> Nobody can do that. I, I'm not being a wise guy to you. Nobody can do it. I'm sure we'll still have technology. I'm sure that good companies will still be leaders. But for a long time in the 70s through the 80s, Coca-Cola, which had a giant multiple into the nifty 50 peak in 1974, made money every single year for the next 12, 14, 16 years. The stock didn't go up. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but after the 1999 peak, Microsoft did not make a new high until about 2013. So these are terrific companies, but it doesn't say they have to go up in perpetuity. That I think is very difficult for tech investors to believe, and it's also difficult to believe if you haven't been through a prior cycle where this has occurred, or something like this has occurred. Shoot. Do you think the inventory market is the environment is still more real? Um, so uh, um, in April of 2021, I wrote a note entitled Raiders of the Lost Ark, A-R-K-K. -K. Um, and I thought then that Ark was in trouble. I'm not going to answer your question specifically, but I'm going to answer it like this. If ARC was a bubble, as other bubbles have occurred, then bubbles do not break until they go down 80 to 90% from their peak. I'm not saying that that's what I expect, but if ARC was indeed a bubble, then bubbles do not cease going down or you know, find their low point or ebb until they go down 80 to 90%. So um, if that is true, then that's kind of what you could expect. I'll also tell you in five weeks, so this is now April, I think it was five weeks from February into March, ARC still had positive weekly fund inflows. It wasn't going up. I mean, that tells you that people still haven't come to grips with the problems there in the stocks they own. George has a particular view about that he shares. Yeah, yeah, George is, uh, he's a little bit more profane than I am. <laughs> um, okay, so here goes. If this was the only chart you had in your quiver, for lack of a better analogy, and I told you that this is the Bloomberg Commodity Spot Index relative to the S&P, the low was at April 20, it's now accelerated here in favor of commodities and against the S&P and prior commodity cycles that lasted about 15 years, and you can see them up at the top, do you think that you'd want to explore some commodity or commodity related equities, or at least be open to the item, the notion that maybe the S&P underperforms for some length of time here, longer than what most people in our business consider? Okay, I'm, I was glad, I, I didn't remember if I put this in. Um, so uh, any basketball fans here? Not Georgetown basketball. Um, so uh, does anybody know the name Hakeem Olajuwon or Dikembe Mutombo? Okay, so so what I, I had this in there for another presentation, but I said that this got Dikembe Mutombo and Hakeem Olajuwon right here, right? Because they're two tremendous shot blockers in NBA history. So uh, in November of 2021, December 2021, I put this chart out and it was it's the S&P relative to gold. And I said, when it was here, if you are buying the S&P here and selling gold, then essentially you're betting for this. Okay, and so now it's turned down, that's lucky, but it turned down uh, in favor of gold relative to the S&P. So I think gold will continue to outperform the S&P. Does anybody know what tax weighting is in the S&P? What, what is it? 
say it. So uh, I adjusted it. Text weighting in the S&P is over 40%. So the S&P conveniently took out stuff from its tech sector in uh, September of 2018, and I put it back. So what the S&P tells you tech is at 25%, it's wrong. How can text weighting now be lower than it was in uh, 2000? It can't be. How can text weighting be lower when um, seven companies are 26% of the S&P 500? It can't be, it can't be. This is what I'm talking about how you have to think differently from what you're being told. So I ask you, I can't even remember if I put the chart in there, but if I did, we'll get to it. But just to give you an idea, if you are bullish on tech in the S&P 500 and you are overweighting tech relative to other sectors, you're betting that tech will grow from 45% to over 50% of the S&P 500. That's what you're betting. Because tech normally goes up about 20% a year. That's what you're betting. So it'll go from 45% to 54% or thereabouts. And if you continue to bet it, then you believe in two years, tech will be 60% of the S&P. Is that a good bet? You always get hurt by the biggest thing in the market. You never get hurt by the smallest thing. Okay, so I have this table here. I went back to um, 2000 and I just counted the days. Over 649 days from NASDAQ's March 10th, 2000 peak to the October 10th, 2000 low. Um, NASDAQ rallied on a daily basis 47% of the time. I mean, it was just less than a coin flip. But from peak to trough, NASDAQ was down 80%. So being involved in a bear market is hard. Richard Russell, who has since passed, was the Dean of Wall Street Newsletter Writers. He once said, the most difficult thing in our business is to stay in a bull market from beginning to end. The second most difficult thing is to stay out of a bear market from beginning to end. I wonder about this because in terms of the, the investors now in the market, the only real bear market they've seen would be technically in March of 2020, which is like three weeks. It's kind of a junior bear market, yeah. Um, and even after the, the great the transit, financial crisis, right, that was sort of isolated. And, and they had late 2018 into early 2019. Right. No one has really seen, yeah, if, sure. you're young, if you're younger, you really have not experienced the, 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 it's true. the 99.com crash or it's the, true. the NASDAQ hit 5,000. It's true. You're until right. it went to 2,000 and didn't cross back from you know, that. Do you, do you see, do you think that is what, is that, is that a potential problem here where just people haven't experienced it? I think it is It is uh, that uh, a problem that people have not experienced it. I also, also think uh, from, my side of the street, Jason Trenet wrote a book called My Side of the Street, um, that uh, Steve Chauvin, who was my partner at Lehman Brothers, said to me, he had a lot of great sayings. Um, and one of the best one was, if you're bearish and you're right, they hate you. If you're bearish and you're wrong, you're an idiot. So um, the Fed has been able to bail out investors for a long time. It is paid to be bullish and to stay bullish and to buy every dip. But I think they back themselves into a corner. They really are gonna have a hard time helping investors here. They have a tremendous inflation problem. A tremendous inflation problem that they have to battle while also trying to maintain some semblance of order in the market without creating a, high, a higher unemployment rate. Or a high unemployment rate. By the way, Jason was here. And for those of you who were here, one of the things that Jason said was macro doesn't matter until it does. Yeah, he's right. Yeah, right. because the Fed kept rates pinned for a long time and now they're no longer pinned. So macro does matter. I worked with a guy named Bill Callanan when I was at Soros and uh, Key Square Capital Management. And you remember the Trump MAGA hats? Well, he had a red hat made that said, Make macro great again. <laughs> and then uh, I did a, a, a macro webinar uh, when I was at Wolf. And I had 20 hats printed, uh, not in red, but in black. It said, make macro great again. And I gave it to, uh, to my uh, webinar panelists. Okay, so uh, here goes. If you're, in the, if you're in the investment group or you own some stocks yourself, these are some of the questions you should be asking yourself. Number one, where is the item I own in relation 
to its 50 and 200 day moving averages. Forget the pink one, that's the 100. But where is the item you own in relation to those averages? Number two, what is the slope of those averages? If you own an item long that is below downward sloping 50 and 200 day moving averages, you better think twice about owning it. That's number one. Number two is, does the item you own respond well to good news? Does the item you own, a corollary to that is, ignore bad news? When tech was going up, it embraced every piece of good news, ignored every piece of bad news. Does anybody remember when Facebook gapped down and lost a quarter of a trillion dollars in one day? In one day. Do you think Facebook may have been a little bit mispriced? Do you guys have access to Bloomberg? Yeah. yeah. When you check Bloomberg, go and look at AMAT or um, Avago or Taiwan Semiconductor and do TSM equity ANR and see what the analyst ratings are. See what the analyst ratings are on something for, like HubSpot or Microsoft or Google or Amazon or NVIDIA. See what the ratings are. Nobody bears on those stocks and they don't go up anymore. That's an issue. Okay, this is NASDAQ on a weekly basis. That green line is a, uh, pardon me, this is, uh, um, that is a 40 week moving average. It's a weekly chart on a 40 week moving average. This is a weekly momentum indicator. I really don't want to talk about indicators. I want to talk about trends. I doubt that anybody in this room has ever made any money or any big money or any real money buying an item that's below a downward sloping 40 week moving average. I really doubt it. I really doubt it. So I have a thesis. My thesis is that we're in a bear market that is going to erase everything post the COVID breakout that occurred in the summer of 2020 or the autumn of 2020. That would mean NASDAQ gets down to about 10,000. That's my thesis. I thought that that was goose, of course, because of COVID. I don't know what I would have done if I was on any of those committees, but I think it was boost, and I think it's going to be taken away. Well, there's still a moving average, but I don't know. Maybe I don't think about it. The details are easier, I'm sure. But can you talk about, you talked about when they're below the 50 and 200 day, but at what point above those levels, especially once they restart getting a little wary of being overvalued? Well, uh, okay. So, I think about okay, so I wouldn't use the term overvalued. I would just use the term extended. So the way to do it, is you take the price of your item and divide it by your moving average. And you can do this historically, right? Because it's gonna be a percentage figure, which is probably pretty good over the lifetime of that item. So I'll tell you, uh, in the dot-com bubble, stocks routinely got to more than 100% above their 200-day moving average. Moving average, pardon me. I will never buy a stock that is 100% above its 200-day moving average. Just imagine you holding a two-pound weight like this, against your body, you could hold it for days. But if you held it out here for any length of time, anaerobic respiration sets in, you can't hold it there. That's the way the stock is in relation to its moving average. Now you might like 150 days, you may like some other periodicity, I just use 200. So you can, each item is different, right? And growth stocks will get bigger relative to their moving averages, cyclical stocks generally will not. So that's kind of the way I think about it. Um, so Shoot. I know there's a little side question. Go ahead. There's, there's an online question. So it's a, and I know you, you may have, you want to pass on this. Go ahead. Want to indicate it. Does a golden cross or a death cross greatly influence your investment decision? It's the slope of the moving averages more than the cross. The slope of the moving averages. Right. Okay. And where the item is in relation to those, to the slope of those moving averages. So for example, you know, if it is below those moving averages and then you get the proverbial death cross, that's a bad time. I mean, if it is above the moving averages and you get the proverbial golden cross, that would be a pretty good sign. But that is merely one item on your balance sheet as to way, why you should do it. Is there a good trend? Is there a big base? Has it set itself up? What is the group doing? Your chances of success are greater if you buy a stock in a strong group rather than buying a strong stock in a weak group. Oh, go ahead. Well, sorry. Sure, I was asking about whether or not the trend is extended. Mean to say that the price divided by SMA is a certain number that's extended, or just visually? No, you you could do it. Yeah, I, I would say buy, download the data, do it on a weekly basis, take the price in this column, create a forty-week moving average in the second column, and divide them. 
and then graph that, uh, what comes out, the quotient. And then you plot that against the stock price itself. It's not perfect because nothing is, but it'll give you an idea where you are more at risk relative to being less at risk. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. And uh, you only use simple. Yeah, it's <laughs> much. Uh, so, so uh, I'm so old that when I got into the business, uh, Bloomberg did not allow you to download their data. So I had to create everything in Excel myself. I wasn't going to write a formula for exponential moving averages. I, I wasn't going to do it. And Andrew Lowe will tell you in his book, the reason that you have round number moving averages is because when it was started, people had a, a ledger and an adding machine on their desk. And it was relatively easy to compute 10 day, 50 day, 100 day, 150 day, and 200 day moving averages. Okay. We, no, this is good. What do you say to value investors who already believe they have a strong margin of safety but have not experienced the true bear market? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I don't, so, so, so I, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I, I'm gonna give you a corollary to that. So I've been asked a lot recently, what will get you more constructive on the market? And I almost want to say, what will get you less constructive on the market? So far, it's right to be cautious. What will have to happen for your thesis to play out? Nobody really has an answer to that, right? Because they've been taught their thesis is really, the Fed is behind you. And relative to rates, you wanna buy a fast grower. As Jason coined, I don't, he may have coined it, but he is fond of using the phrase, Tina, there is no alternative. Um, with bonds uh, rates up a lot, there are alternatives. So this is my adjusted tech market cap. So the pink is my line, the blue is the S&P's line. Um, so you can see at last count, it was 42% of the S&P peaked at 45% December 21, just above where it was in September, uh, December 21, just above where it was in September of 20, where it was 44, 44%. I think this has nowhere to go but down. Now, does it get back down to here? I don't know, but I'm not buying tech at 40 plus percent of the S&P in a bear market. They're the most expensive stocks. Now you will hear, if you haven't already heard, that uh, the economy is going to slow, the Fed is gonna raise rates, and you wanna own growth stocks in a slow economic growth environment. You've heard it, right? Well, I don't think it's gonna work because these stocks are still too expensive. When you plug higher rates into your dividend discount model, are these stocks still cheap? Uh, here's financials market cap as a percent of the S&P. I add back in uh, REITs. The S&P also took REITs out to create their own bucket, but I add back um, the figure for financials. So tax almost 42%, financials are almost 14%. How can the S&P go up when 55, 56% of it is deteriorating? The financials really are the market's bodyguard. They don't have to win. They don't have to be leaders. They just can't go down. So I created my own index recently. I call it the big five. It's Bank America, Citigroup, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. They're all in some trouble here. Citigroup is the worst performer there, and JP Morgan is the second worst performer. I can't figure that the other three are going to be able to be leaders on the upside if the prior two are performing poorly. So uh, the takeaway here is, you should have an idea what the big financials are doing. If they're going up on an absolute basis, they don't have to win relatively. Or if they're winning absolute and relative, then you're in a bull market. But if they're going down on an absolute basis, it's really hard for the S&P to go up. This is energy's market cap as a percent of the S&P. It bottomed in October 2020 at 2%. It's now 4% of the S&P. It doubled. In March of 2021, I wrote the breakdown level was just below 5% in the spring of 2019. Is there anyone out there who's betting the sector can get back there? It's a pretty good bet back then. These help, right? It tells you where people are overweight. And it tells you where people are underweight. This is part of that whole ESG mandate. It got people out of these stocks. And then you have a commodity bull market, then you can't get enough of these. Price of oil is often considered a leading indicator. What do you think about the recent volatility of oil and are there other leading indicators that 
So if you go back to oil, uh, there's not a lot of history of this, so it's not admissible in SAS class, but it's admissible in portfolio management class. Um, if you go back to 1990, this is the fourth cycle with Brent, not West Texas, because West Texas got the negative numbers, so I want to use Brent here, where Brent has been up more than 100% year on year. I'm certainly no economist, but in the three prior cycles, the US entered a recession, either coincident with that occurring or shortly thereafter. So I think oil is an important consideration here. Uh, George, I think, and um, his guy, I, don't know, I can't remember who his guy is, but he thinks oil can get much higher. I think there's volatility here because it's been up a lot and there's a lot of uh, conflicting information here with respect to Russia, Ukraine, et cetera. There are a lot of kind of uh, inputs to that. But it's been up a lot um, and it's pulled back some, but I think this is what happens after you have big rallies. You tend to have some more volatility. This is the S&P, pardon me. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go till I'll go a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, so this is the S&P in the same uh, fashion as NASDAQ. Where are you in relation to your 50 and 200 day moving averages? Where are you? So the 50 day uh, is, is down, flattened out is because we had this big rally. Please remember that table I had, which shows you the rallies in the NASDAQ bear market. There were a lot of big rallies. And we got a big rally there uh, and it got through and it probably suffered a lot of people in. I didn't believe the rally because I thought it was a rally in a bear market. And if you watch what European indexes were doing, especially the OMX of Sweden, Germany, France, Italy, they all had rallies into what are resistance level, downward sloping moving averages, cresting moving averages. And I thought it was a good spot to sell. And if I was selling it, there, I certainly was selling it here. This is the S&P on a weekly basis going back to 2006. Uh, we had kind of a major league overbought reading here and a minor league oversold reading here. Go ahead. Okay, so um, there's always a bull market somewhere. Um, the S&P and NASDAQ, I think, are capped, but there's a commodity-related bull market. I think uh, you have to be uh, very open-minded about the stock market. And I think you have to be willing to look in areas that you're not, you would not normally need to, to look for. Uh, I know that, I, I'm gonna tell you a funny story about a hedge fund manager. Uh, I won't name his name, but you will know his name if I did name it. So um, in the commodity bull market, it was in 01, 02, 03, that started it into 08, and then of course 11. I went to see him. I was invited in by one of his portfolio managers and I brought two packages of charts. One package of charts was doing this, are you with me? And the other package of charts was doing this. No names were on the charts. I wanted him to make an objective decision. And I went through all of them. I flipped them, he looked at them, and I said to him, which package do you wanna buy? He said, Oh, I want to buy the ones that are going up. And I said, what do you want to do with those other ones? He says, I want to short those. I said, me too. He said, what are they? I said, the ones that are going up are natural resource commodity related stocks and the ones that are going down are tech. And he said, oh, I'm not doing that. I said, why? You just identified it objectively. He said, you don't understand. When tech goes up, it goes up more than anybody's ever imagined. Those stocks that are going up now will just be cyclical rallies. And he was right. But when they're going down, it's tough to own them. So when tech goes up, it beats everything. It's just not going up more. When it goes up, I hope that I'm open-minded enough to pay attention. Okay, um, I created a growth to non-growth ratio. Some people like growth to value. I didn't want to identify or define value. So this is an easy thing. You could do it on your own Bloomberg. I'll tell you what it is. It's um, XLK plus XLY in the numerator. In the denominator, it's XLB plus XLE plus XLF plus XLI. So that's tech and discretionary in the numerator. In the denominator, it's basics, energy, financials, and industrials. That's it. Please note that the last time you had a bear market for growth relative to non-growth, uh, it lasted for eight plus years. Now, I'm not telling you that history will repeat in detail but I have to pay attention here. Uh, this is the big seven, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Nvidia, and Tesla. Um, and this is relative to the S&P, which despite the fact that you own these things, 
you haven't beaten the S and P since the midpoint of 2020. All the commodity related stuff has beaten the S and P. This is the Philadelphia Semiconductor in this. The SOX, I want to short it. I think there's risk to 2000. This is it relative to the S and P. It's broken relative to the S and P. Has anybody heard that there's a semiconductor shortage? How come these stocks aren't on the moon? Anybody? But I mean, how long is that for that to occur? Well, I mean, shouldn't the semiconductor analysts have reduced their ratings on these stocks? I don't have the answer. I only ask the questions. There's supposed to be a semiconductor shortage. I think ultimately, you know how there's a strategic petroleum reserve? I think there's going to be a strategic semi reserve. I think there's going to be strategic commodity reserves. And I think releasing oil from the strategic petroleum reserve is bullish for oil. They got to put it back. I think so. I really do. So I, I want to sell also the Taiwan stock exchange on Bloomberg. It's TWSE. And of course, by default, I want to sell Taiwan Semi, which is 2230 space TT on Bloomberg and TSN here in the States. Taiwan Semi is in pink. The Taiwan index itself is in black. It's just a semiconductor offshoot of what's going on here in the stocks, right? Here's the Taiwan Semi on a monthly basis. Let's forget that chart for a second. If all you had was this at the bottom, would you be a buyer of Taiwan? Anybody? Here's big financials, Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and Morgan Stanley. Citi and JP Morgan are already below their post COVID breakout levels. On a relative basis, Citi and JP Morgan are below here. I think Bank of America is next. Terrible weekly momentum. You can see here, look, momentum peaked here in early 2021. Price did not peak until later in 2021. So there's this negative momentum debt that has to be paid by those stocks. The only way you can pay this is for these to come down. And they're also weak relative to the S&P. Energy, uh, uh, you told me that you guys have, uh, are there. I mean, this is up 200% relative winner, healthcare winner, real estate still hanging in there, and utilities have been a massive winner. Massive. I will bet every dollar in my pocket that there isn't, that there's not many uh, vanilla managers who have bought a ton of utilities because rates were going up. Historically, utilities do not work when rates are going up. I think this has been mostly retail driven. So here goes, these are my six indexes. Uh, I call it Bang, which is an homage to Bang, Coal, Burtz, INR, Shippers, and Uranium. And as of my last update, I was up 20, the indexes themselves were up 22, 66, 28, 28, 37, and 37 and a half. And I killed both the S&P and NASDAQ. The charts had turned. Most people didn't want to own them. And I thought it was a shot to hit a home run. So that's why I made these indexes. Yeah. Do you think the way to play commodities is through the stocks or through trend following the actual physical? I think you have to pay attention to the physical. Nobody in here is buying physical. But there are a lot of ETF ways. You can see them at the bottom. That's the way to be involved, right? There's the Invesco, two versions. There's a global copper, uh, minor ETF. Van Eck has a bunch of things. Um, so forget these. This is an index and this is an index. But there's something called Veggie. You can buy, well, you can't buy XAU, the index. Uh, but you could certainly buy IAU Gold, and there's the XME, which is an ETF. That's a metals. Um, here's gold, which you saw already. Um, so uh, gold is a base and breakout metal. Base breakout of 260%. 27 years. I like to use the term Brobdingnagian. It's from Gulliver's Travels. He went to the island of the Lilliputians, which were the small people. And then he went to the island of the Brobdick Nags. I just made it an adjective. They were the giant people. Big base 
out of the second base up 100 percent out of the third up the third one up 190 if you add two and three it's up almost 500 percent and out of the fourth base it went up 50 percent breaking out from here could gold have a 3,000 target i guess so here's my iron ore stock index base and breakout my uranium index, when I put this in here, it was up 9% one day from last week, and it's up almost 40% year to date. Cameco is the biggest uranium in uh, stock, and this is uranium relative to the S&P. I think ultimately, the greens will be proven wrong with respect to their focus on wind and solar. I think uranium is the future. Okay, they talk about saving the environment. Uranium can help. Uh, I won't say anymore. Um, so here's the XME. Which, so you can see this. This is a, uh, a monthly basing here within a nine year big base above upward sloping moving average. And then you had a breakout and it went from 47 to 60. That's a pretty nice move in two months. The setup was there. You just have to be able to identify it. Okay, and here are rates one, three, and six. I got to wrap this up because I got to catch a train. Um, here's the German two year, which had its own big base and breakout. Again, I thought this was a fairly easy thing. The German two year, uh, 10 year here, um, I'm going to pass that one. And um, there's a great conceit among hedge funds for a de dollarization to occur. So far, the dollar is not paying attention. Um, and so uh, Bitcoin is in blue. Gold is in black, and at the bottom, it's gold relative to Bitcoin. There's been too much emotion, in my humble opinion, surrounding Bitcoin. It might work, but I mean, uh, the internet had a problem, or tech stocks had a problem after they peaked in 2000. Who's to say that Bitcoin couldn't work spectacularly, but go through a period where it didn't really work in terms of making you money? Um, so do you guys know the name Paul Tudor Jones? Okay, so Paul Tudor Jones started as a commodity trader in New Orleans. And he said, he's had some great quotes over time. Uh, one of my favorites is price moves and then a narrative follows. But he said, uh, when he started to trade commodities, there was not a lot of information on commodities. So he and other commodity traders had to become expert in their charts. To your point, I think you have to become expert in the charts items that don't have a lot of fundamental information. So I, have, I agree with you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, 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 uh. In terms of work now, Wall Street, um, he talked about using cash flow in the air. How is that different from momentum trading? What is he talking about? Um, using cash flow, I just wonder about. Um, I think um, dogs bark at what they don't know. Um, and I think um, there's a lot of ways to win in this business. I, I'm fond of using this analogy. Um, on the Serengeti, there are a whole bunch of grass eaters. There are elands, there are zebras, there are gazelles. They all can survive by eating grass. How can they all do that? Because they all eat a different part of the grass. Some eat the top, some eat the middle, some eat the lower. I think there are a lot of ways to win in the market. I prefer to win in my fashion. It's also, I have to stick to what I do rather than bringing in fundamental argument. So um, does anybody know the name Mariano Rivera, who is uh, uh, for the Yankees' greatest relief pitcher of all time? The Yankees never said to Mariano Rivera, you're such a good relief pitcher, you should play first base too. They never said that. They let him do what he was going to do and do his job. I think that's the way, I'm not saying I'm equivalent to Mariano Rivera. What I'm saying is people pay me because I do my job, not a fundamental person's job. Sure. Is there a reason why it takes the green to be longer versus max? Is it because it's an issue of money capex or like, what are, what are the reasons why you think that green energy stocks might not do that job? Uranium is cleaner. You need one uranium plant. 
It produces over 30 years, one garbage pail filled with what? Full of waste. It doesn't kill bald eagles. You don't need a giant sun field to put out solar panels. What happens when you discard a solar panel? What do you need in terms of the motor and the metals to make the, wind, uh, the windmill? What do you need? France is nuclear. Germany listened to a 14 year old Swedish race. Look at their position. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with one last thing with respect to the market. If somebody makes a market appeal to you that is emotional, you should think exactly the opposite. Emotional appeals do not work. They do not work. I tried to share that with my sons. Emotional appeals do not work. Churchill had a great quote during World War II. He says, America always does the right thing, only as it's exhausting every other option. <laughs> I think it might be appropriate. I got to catch a train. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, John.